Thank you, Guru Dash. So thank you ever so much for coming to the party to hear what so many of us have to say about the Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Jhumpa Lahiri's first book of fiction, a collection of short stories titled The Interpreter of Maladies. I'm Dr. Julie Banerjee Mehta, for those of you who don't know me, and on behalf of the library subcommittee and the president, Mr. S. N. Mukherjee of the Bengal Club and the club itself, very warm welcome to all of you this evening who've joined us across puddles and ponds, across borders and nations and from our own city, of course. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation about a book which put the diasporic South Asian American Jhumpa Lahiri brand on the literary map. Um, we always welcome diverse views. And I think it's this diversity that brings so much delight and richness to our conversation at the Bengal Club book club discussions. So I think we can all expect um, some brickbats and a lot of bouquets. So I look forward to that. Librarian writer with a PhD in Renaissance studies, Lahiri is a product of that beautiful city on the East Coast, Boston. She's a Boston girl, as she says. Written in what might term an uncluttered, direct style, others may tot it up as unexceptional. The collection published in 1999 got Lahiri star status globally. The girl next door, who seemingly came from a very ordinary family from Kolkata, was born in the UK and cut her teeth on reading, writing, and arithmetic in the USA, where her father worked as a librarian and a mother for a school teacher. But to be the youngest winner of the Pulitzer at 32 years, there must be something exceptional in her and the family that nurtured and supported her. Lahiri bagged the pen. Can't hear. It's silent. It's silent. Can you hear now? Yeah, this is better. Okay. So where did I lose you guys? The girl next door, did you hear that? Yes, yes. girl next yes. door. Okay, yeah. so to be the youngest writer and winner of the Pulitzer at 32, there must have been something exceptional in her and the family that nurtured and supported her. Lahiri bagged the Penn Hemingway Award for the best debut fiction. An O. Henry Award and a bevy of literary awards including being named one of the 20 writers for the 21st century by the New Yorker. I'm sure you'll agree this was remarkable, really, from what Lahiri once described as just, I quote, nine little stories. One well-known critic opined that interpreter stood out because it didn't try to stand out. There are no shock plots. Lahiri instead focuses on the uniqueness of ordinary life. You can relate to her characters because their plights could easily be your own. A young couple trying to stay together after losing a baby, a housewife yearning to be more independent, a young second generation, more American than Indian little girl trying to understand the Bangladesh war as a diasporic child. Beneath the surface, though, her fiction takes the pulse of first and second generation Indian Americans trying to bridge the gap between the country they call home and the heritage that defines them. Where is home? What does it mean to be unmoored of language, culture, food, and history? These are the questions this writer poses in a beguiling manner. 
the trajectories her characters traverse, through the spaces between the lines in her stories are about the daily heroic because they battle the formidable challenges of unstable identity, disappointment, racial discrimination, and loss. And yet, they fight to survive in a homeland their parents adopted. It is this ordinariness that strikes a chord in many of her readers. Every story is a journey, says Lahiri, for her. So to leave you with an interesting thought, a couple of interesting thoughts, I managed to dig up where the title Interpreter of Maladies emerged from. Please switch off uh, your, put yourselves on mute, please, if you're um, not speaking. Lahiri shared the process with Kanga. This title was born before I even knew what the story would be about. At first, it was simply a phrase that came to me during my graduate school in Boston. One day, I crossed paths with an acquaintance of Armenian descent who had kindly helped me move sometime before into one of may, many of the Boston apartments that I inhabited. We stopped, we chatted, and he told me he was working in a doctor's office, translating on behalf of the doctor's many Russian patients. As I walked back home, the phrase interpreter of melodies popped into my head as a way of describing what this person was doing. It lingered long enough for me to jot the phrase down on a piece of paper. Every so often, I would come across it thinking it might make a good title, but the story didn't materialize for another five years. I think that gives us a, a pretty good insight into her process of writing. Lahiri's stories are simply told. They signpost the sadness of separation or celebrate the deep ties that might bind strangers who inhabit an unfamiliar space with no shared history or showcase the pride mild-mannered foreigners might display in the face of Anglo-American bias. In our discussion today, there might, I expect, be some remarkable psychological insights that will throw more light on the human condition. In the story, which is my favorite, When Mr. Pirzada Came to Dine, the second short story in Jhumpa Lahiri's collection, little Lilia, who is pampered with chocolates and sweets and treated like one of the visitor, Mr. Pirzada's own daughters says, and I quote, that night when I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth, I only pretended to brush my teeth for I feared that I would somehow rinse the prayer out if I spat the toothpaste out. I wet the brush and rearranged the table and then I took the tube of paste and put it away to prevent my parents from asking any questions and then fell asleep with sugar on my tongue. In the first story of the collection, a temporary matter, the omniscient narrator states in the last lines of the short story, and I quote, Shoba had turned the lights off. She came back to the table, sat down, and after a moment, Shukumar joined her. They wept together for the things they now knew. Mrs. Sen, in the story Mrs. Sen, finds succor and comfort in seeking out Chad in her quest to save her Ilishmat and takes long bus rides, stands up to mockery from a bus driver who casts aspersion on her ability to speak English. This evening's lineup is richly studded with readers, explorers, scholars who bring the depth and breadth of multitudinous disciplines, including literature, psychology, and cinema. We could look forward, I think, to a diverse small gas board of views. Gurudash, may we see the PowerPoint just run through the slides so we all have a visual image? Sure, ma'am. Thank you.
So for you today, we have collected a few visuals which might uh, work with the theoretical basis of diasporic writing. And I think to enrich the conversation, it might do us some good to carry back some of the questions that we ask in this PowerPoint. Next one, please. So Lahiri has become a quick international success. And uh, she's gone through being, uh, you know, a, a, a librarian. She's gone through being, uh, earning her doctoral degree in Renaissance studies. And she has married uh, a man who is a reporter, who's a journalist, and she has two children. Despite the 22 years that have passed since Interpreter of Maladies, it is never forgotten that she received the Pulitzer Prize at a time when Barack Obama, the president of America, was in the chair and was able to uh, offer her the award. So Gurudash, maybe we can move on to the next one. Here she is, all agog, and Obama said that the points about belonging and home that come through in her stories of ordinary people made him aware, a little bit more aware of the Indian community in North America. Next one, please. So I want to leave you with some ideas today that go beyond the stories and in the need for inventing tradition, there is the signposting that we need to preserve our heritage. This happens usually in the first generation of diasporics, of immigrants. So there is a clash of tradition and modernity between the first generation parents, and we see this very much right through Jhumpa Lahiri's works, very much so in the namesake. So I have tried to unpackage Interpreter of Maladies and her other work through the idea of locating her work on the tongue. Tongue as a location of language and tongue also as a location of a cultural history, which is food. So although in the beginning, first generation uh, parents would try to um, showcase their heritage, there is often a pushback from the second generation. But later in life, the need to retrieve the fatherland and the mother tongue becomes quite apparent. So it, these stories are about identity, belonging, what it means to be a hyphenated Canadian or a US person, empowering the visible minority, being understood by the majority, Anglo-Canadian connect, diasporic North Americans. How does this dynamism work or not work? That's what is the core of Jumba Lahiri's stories. She is successful at times and not so successful at others. Next one, please. So the idea of unhoused, which is such a favorite with scholars who are here today. And I know uh, the master's finalist, Raka Mukherjee will be talking about unhoused. And I, I think it should be an interesting idea that she will explicate. Finding the past in order to locate the present. And the idea of Hayden White that all fiction is history and all history is fiction. So there is a blurring between what's real and what's not so real. In Jhumpa Lahiri's Interpreter of Maladies, for instance, Mrs. Sen's nostalgia is signposted through her urgency to recreate the food of her homeland. And this is the kind of research which is being followed the world over today to unveil the instinct of the diasporic person 
to find a comfort zone from eating familiar food. This association is known to be one of the most important cultural markers. So again, think of the tongue as the site of your mother tongue, your own language, and the language that you have acculturated to, usually English, if we are talking about North America. And then with the idea of standing up and speaking back to the majority, which is the center. So the tongue becomes a site of power and empowerment. Next one, please, Kurudash. So I would like to just come back to retrieving identity by memory recall, something that Salman Rushdie talks about in imaginary homelands. So what is the story of the expatriates quest? They are haunted by a sense of loss, an urge to reclaim, to look back. But if we do look back, we must do so in the knowledge that our physical alienation almost inevitably means that we will not be able to reclaim exactly that, that was lost. So what we try to do is that we try to create short imaginations of the mind. We try to create not actual cities or villages, but invisible ones, imaginary homelands, ideas of the mind. Salman Rushdie is supposed to be the father of all post-colonial diasporic literature, not lived in India or Pakistan, but has always come back here to do his digging, to do his research, as have all the diasporic writers, including uh, the lady on our plate today, uh, Jhumpa Lahiri. As I said to you, Kolkata, through her parents, was born in the UK, raised in the East Coast of the USA in a beautiful city, Boston. And now very much associated with Italy. So she is a global traveler. She's the nomad that we all are if we are homeless and living in many places in the world. Gurudash, next one. So once again, this idea of food, about nostalgia, performing cultural identity, establishing an alternative network of intimacy, not circumscribed necessarily by blood and filiation of family ties. Next one, please. So I want to look at Mrs. Sens and Pirzada, the, when Mr. Pirzada came to dinner story, just very quickly uh, about the food that is uh, reiterated again and again, so that it's almost signposted in the reader's mind, whether we are able to share her acquired knowledge about the food of the homeland that gives her comfort and gives her readers in North America and the rest of the world outside of India comfort, or whether it is a marker of standing up and saying that, no, I'm a Bengali. Even though I'm living in America, I will use the boti to cut my fish and I will travel all that way to the coast to buy my shad, which I will imagine is Ilish much. Next one, please. So before we come to Mrs. Sen's, I also want you to remember that in the namesake, there is a beautiful quote. On a sticky August evening, two weeks before her due date, Oshima Ganguly stands in the kitchen of a Central Square apartment in New York, combining Rice Krispies, planters peanuts, and chopped red onion in a bowl. She adds salt, lemon juice, thin slices of green chili pepper, wishing there were mustard oil to pour into the mix. When I first read this, it resonated with my condition and it resonated with the condition of so many hundreds and thousands of diasporic people who were in North America. If you get the gist of it, you want to always create the authentic, 
absolute authenticity, but authenticity is an evolving game. You can't always get what you remember or what you're told from years ago. So you have to invent tradition and add Rice Krispies and planters peanuts and go without that mustard oil. So I will not uh, stop the flow of the evening. So Gurudash, let's put this to rest. I have a lot more slides, but I think it will take away your time. Uh, so we will put it away now. I have just three admonishments to all of you before we start this remarkable journey today. Uh, the first is that please keep your responses strictly to three minutes so that we have a whole array of voices who will add uh, diversity and richness to our conversation. Please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And the third is enjoy the evening. So without further ado, may I call upon Professor Choitali Moitro to raise the curtain to this evening's presentations. Choitali, go ahead. Thank you, Julie, Dee, and good evening to each and every one of you. I should thank Julie Dee again for choosing the book because rereading this book for many of us actually gives rise to many Derridian perspectives and uh, enhances the richness of appreciating life. What I felt after reading, after this reading, particularly for this evening, uh, number one would be that most stories center on the second phase of Indian immigration, which already takes in certain families, friends, or relatives who are already in America, which gives a sense of settlement and not settlement for the people who are coming for the first time. So that is a sort of soft zone of neither here nor there. From where we have to start examining the stories and the common point which I found in more or less, I mean, just one or two stories barring would be the importance of the functionality of a family. How a family is existing in different planes sometimes geographical, sometimes transnational, sometimes even spatial. So the link with the family and home, just now we have seen imaginary homelands as Julie Dee showed us in her PPT, is uh, quite important. And the next point is what we all agree, I think is portrayal of characters who are accepted as whatever they are. And there is an authorial gaze, if I may say so, of the authors accepting the characters exactly as they are. I think uh, Julie Dee said that she is uh, trying to talk about the ordinariness of the extraordinariness of ordinary things. That is important. And uh, this postmodern inconclusiveness is. Uh, the most important characteristic of uh, these stories. And maybe understanding human material in general by exposing the binaries creates uh, a zone of appreciation. I feel like talking, especially mentioning the story called The Blessed House, where the characters are sort of coming to the fore over the little sort of piece of Jesus Christ, the showpiece of Jesus Christ. And finally, I think there is a sort of uh, appeal of this book where we all try to rise above the human dilemma and we are not able to do so. It is this helplessness amongst us that we sort of identify as readers in the characters that are delineated. That's it, Julie Dee. You can continue. Choitali, always on point, always focused. Loved your uh, assessment that at the core of her stories is the functionality of the family. And I think this is what is uh, you know, appealing to many readers. 
uh, Choidalia also comes to mind, and we can keep it for a later discussion with others as well, that publishing as a diasporic writer, what you say, the functionality of the family, especially the relationship, which is very contested between the first and the very second generation. Very very, yes. the, the, the problem is that the writer is pressured more and more by publishers to exoticize the East. So again, yes. you know, we are thinking of Orientalism, we are thinking of how yes. these yes. postmodern writers too, postcolonial writers, are the darling of the publishers if they write, oh no, 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 don't write about America. No, 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 no. Write about the diasporic immigrants in America with all their little, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies, their inabilities, or their weirdness. So your point, you know, speaks also, makes a bridge to all the other connectors that come with publishing in the diaspora. Thank you so much, Chuitali. Um, Shutopa, are you there? Shutopa Banerjee? Okay. Myself. Yeah. Oh, yes. Great. Go ahead, Shudapa. Looking forward. Okay. Uh, so I actually finished reading Whereabouts, and then I went back to rereading um, Interpreter of Maladies. And I thoroughly enjoyed your introduction, which is why I always managed to tune in, like when you start or you know just after. I enjoyed also Choitali's, uh, uh, you know, piece on 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 the stories. So, you know, just looking at the set of stories and having read whereabouts and unaccustomed earth, and I hasten to add that my comparison is with that standard and other literary works of fiction. To me, this is, even though it may have won the Pulitzer, patchy. Uh, there is stuff which appealed to me and there is stuff which, you know, left me indifferent. So let me pick out a couple of stories, but I think with paucity of time, I may be able to sort of dwell on only one and uh, what it left me with. And I choose the, the title story, Interpreter of Maladies itself, uh, which I found to be a completely non-judgmental lens on the humdrum pedestrianness of our everyday lives. And it's basically two sets of lives, the Dasas and the Kapasi, Mr. Kapasi. And uh, it's, uh, you know, what I like is that it is actually a rather funny look. If you look at it, it's, it's a very funny take on both lives, but in a, you know, but there is poignancy to it for want of a better word. And if we don't take ourselves too seriously and if we look at actually our lives, that's what most of our lives are all about. Stylistically, she is, you know, looking at this pedestrian humdrumness in a very unassuming, quiet, unflashy way, uh, almost sort of bringing that to life. And the other piece which comes through is basically the fact that when you peel the layer, uh, what is societally looks quite perfect is never perfect. And maybe that's our way of dealing with our lives as they were. Um, I can stop here, Julie, if I've run out of time. Or I could just take, spend a minute on another story, which is to do with uh, uh, the real Darwan. So I leave yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Quick okay. one. So one minute. Uh, one minute on the real Darwan. Uh, to me, I, I looked at it from a very different way, and I thoroughly relished the story because you know this is an area that I study myself. So this, she brings out human behavior in a really incisive way. So Gurima is loved and you know given a, a quilt, food, chatted with, etc. Within, of course, the construct of our economic classes. But then, even if it is a fictional, almost fictional uh, fear of her harming us or bringing danger to us, we throw all of that love out and we literally throw her out. And it shows you know how the two sides of human nature, uh, the really brutal side, which comes to the fore, is juxtaposed by a side which is quite nice, quite amiable, quite happy. And uh, I actually think that ending is quite brutal. But again, she shines it or she throws the lens in a manner which is very non-judgmental and you know, almost as if she's just reflecting us the way we are. I'll stop. Thank you, Shutapa. Uh, Shutapa is a um, be behavioral scientist, am I right? To talk about. That's right. yeah. Harvard, Harvard trained no less, and her insights are always bingo. 
And here she talks about the lens through which uh, this writer views humanity. And there is really something to be said about her non-bias. Now, that might make it not attractive to some people because it's not strong enough, Shutopa. But to other people, uh, it's you know pretty much uh, a good place to be because I, no I love that. Yeah, I love that. That non-judgmentalness. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Shutopa. Thank now uh, on to Anju Munshi. Anju, are you there? Yeah, there I am. Lovely, lovely. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you and good evening to everybody. Um, Jhumpa Lahiri, an, uh, a British-born immigrant of Indian heritage, definitely does not glorify love. Uh, love for her is not a beautiful, everlasting emotion, you know, which lives, carries on living forever. On the other hand, I think she has, it's a side emotion for her. It's, in most of the stories, it's a side emotion. The main emotion is that of wantedness and the lack of it. I think that is one line which runs throughout all the stories. And also of, uh, uh, you know, unfitting, misfitting mold of relationships, whether it's Shukumar of temporary matter, Miranda of sexy little boy, Elliot and his mother, the mother and son also have, you know, a distant kind of a relationship. Mr. and Mrs. Sane, there is a strong and a recurring theme of alienation, not only from the native lands, but also with people, with, uh, you know, like uh, acquaintances with one another, with their own selves also. And uh, there is a kind of a redeeming moment when she rituals and routines, because rituals and routines give a kind of a comfort and predictability. So she, that's how she talks about, you know, uh, the festivals and the rituals of vegetables when women from neighborhood come there, there, there are lots of instances like this. Burima is also lost in her own past. She, she, you know, like pines for her glorious past. Whether or not that's true, that's not the issue. The thing is that she finds a lot of comfort and friendship with her past. Uh, with her past. The interpreter of Malady, I, that's my favorite story again. Uh, I agree with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the lady who spoke before me. Uh, he's, I think he's got a fragmented sense of self. And in meeting the tourist lady, Mrs. Das, he's actually reconnecting with his own self. He finds and rediscovers himself, his emotions and his wantedness. So in a way, I think that there is a relationship metaphor which runs throughout the, uh, the book and with all the stories. Uh, uh, and these are the metaphors for, you know, it's a mechanism to express your own emotions and your experiences. So with every relationship, every character, there is a kind of a metaphor which talks about the kind of inner conflicts that we all have and how we face them. Um, well, Mr. Pirzada, it would be not complete if I wouldn't talk about it, but I think I've, I've finished my time and thank you so much. Have I? Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Anju, we can come back to Pirzada, my favorite story. Okay. Later, okay. later, let's give the other people a little yes. bit of a chance. So, uh, Anju, what I liked about you was the um, invocation of the relationship metaphor. That's something I'll carry back uh, from your talk. Um, wonderfully put. Truly, it is about relationships. And there's always an, either an object or a song or something especially in, the temporary, in a temporary matter. I think that comes to the fore. So uh, carrying on with our members of the Bengal Club first, and then of course we open it up to our very valued guests. Um, Harish, are you here? Harish Mehta? Yeah, I'm very much here, but uh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, I am not familiar with, uh, I'm just a part uh, of the audience listening. I've never read Jhumpa Lehri, and so you'll have to excuse me. I, I might uh, have something uh, after I've heard everybody. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, I thought you had a, uh, as a historian, we always come to you uh, for an over, overview of the diasporic writer. We'll do that in a little while. Can't hear you, Julie. Can't hear you, Julie. Anushuya? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Julie, and good evening to all of you. And uh, I've heard such lovely stuff said by all of you. I uh, would uh, not like to go too much into uh, the stuff that uh, I've heard so far, but I think a prevailing sentiment through her writing is a kind of uh, overview of uh, depression setting in. And uh, you see in the details that she brings in, everywhere there is a melancholia, there is a sadness, and she explores that with great detail in the way it creeps onto a person, in the way Shukumar didn't even brush his teeth, and uh, how his uh, wife uh, would uh, show up, where earlier she used to put things away correctly. She was so disenchanted and disconnected from her own home that now she just think, leaves things around. She didn't even put up the lace curtains she had intended to. So the fact that the dream home was no longer in existence was already being uh, put on record right at the start of the story. And we see how gradually this becomes a reality when they close the story with her announcement that she is going. And the final infliction of pain on her by her husband, by when he chooses that time to tell her that he had actually held their stillborn baby in his arm. So I think there, uh, where she gets so much of insight into behavioral patterns such as this is really hard to imagine because knowing of her life being quite complete emotionally, uh, it's, it's uh, difficult to digest the clarity with which she brings all this on paper. And in fact, what I, while I really enjoy writing, uh, reading her books and her stories, I can't read them uh, in a stretch because there's so little lift in them that uh, I have to take a break. And I, I would like it if there was even one story in between which was humorous or a little light and explore the better, happier sides of life. So that's my little bit here. Anusuya, I couldn't agree with you more. I must admit, um, very depressing. There's a lot of despondency. Yeah. And uh, the other point that you brought up, which was so uh, evocative and which strikes a lot of the students that I've taught this uh, to, the feedback I get is that why couldn't they work it out in a temporary matter? Now, yes. I, I think uh, one of our uh, regular members whom we all know, Indrani Roy, Mrs. Indrani Roy, who's away uh, and, and the time difference at New York City, but at a, at a meeting informally with us, a few of us two days ago, she said something amazing. She says, why the hell didn't they go to a therapist? Yes. Why, can't, why can't they work it out? Why can't it be happy? And this is exactly what my scholars have said and what you are saying, Anusuya. One thing to think about. Um, and I feel uh, being an Indian, there are Indian marriages are not easy, but they hold on. And they hold on because they get past these turns. I mean, I'm sure there are many couples who have lost a child. It's not reason enough for you to part ways. You know, you've come together for better things. Yes. So uh, that's the unresolved part of her writing. Yes, and Anusia, I think we might have a, a bit of a happy surprise if my friend, uh, the therapist, uh, Miki Bhatia is here. She may tell us a little bit about this. We had a chat and I asked her, I invited her to come and give us another perspective from the literary and the history uh, part of this book. All right. So let's moving on. Uh, let's hear um, Professor Dr. Otish Mitro from Montana. He's at the university there and I'm really happy that he woke up early and he always comes to join the party. Okay, Otish, go ahead. Thank you, Julie. Um, this was a good, I'm glad you chose this book. Like many of us, we have read it, I think it was in 99 or something, almost 22 years back. Well, at that time, I hadn't yet gone to the US and uh, it's a different me who is reading it again, uh, having lived here and seen the immigrant families and especially the first generation uh, getting used to things here. So um, I think the author does describe uh, the nature of the immigrant family in a very authentic and skillful way. I mean, it is clear that she has lived 
a, a life growing up like that in such a family. So as you said, uh, somewhere in the beginning, she calls herself a Boston girl. So uh, that's a strength uh, uh, which makes all these immigrant stories in this collection really strong. So whether it will be the description of this, uh, of this married couple uh, that many of you, many of us talked about, they're slowly growing apart in this temporary matter or the young uh, wife, very young wife of a maths professor uh, who, who in her mind lives in a foreign land. And it's clear in this story of Mrs. Sen that she not only thinks she lives in a foreign land, she wants to live in a foreign land because she does say um, somewhere there is this phrase that everything is back at home. So she's just spending her time here because her husband is um, working in the university. So there are these, uh, there, these, are, these are real cases. I mean, there are people who live much of their life like that uh, in this country. So, but, but uh, and also I think the author, what I liked is she takes uh, pleasure in crafting very interesting turns of phrases. For example, I think it was in the last, uh, the third and final continent, uh, the protagonist says that, I flew first to Calcutta to attend my wedding. So, uh, so that itself speaks a lot about uh, the way things are. So if you ask me about a favorite, a, a favorite, I would probably choose out of two or three favorites, a temporary matter. I really liked the way she wove this story. So this couple growing apart, I, I, I am not sure uh, whether they're just growing apart just because of the loss of the, because of the stillborn son. Maybe things were wrong before that. Maybe she met somebody else and grew, grew, and grew close to somebody at work. We, we will never know. But the interesting thing is how during those three or four days when uh, this uh, electricity problem happened, they started playing this little game of sharing unknown secrets with each other. And uh, they become more and more interesting and they both uh, look forward to the evenings every day. And uh, the author is, uh, the reader is made to feel maybe things are getting better. But uh, the last day they share two secrets, the main secrets that the, uh, the, uh, the wife says that she found an apartment and, and is moving out. And the husband says the shocking thing that he did know the sex of the child, the stillborn child, and held him in his heart. So, and as you mentioned earlier, the final sentence of the story sums everything up. They wept together for the things they now knew. And some marriages, I mean, I mean, therapy, of course, is a great thing, but some marriages don't last forever and not all obstacles probably can be overcome. And this obstacle probably was one of them. So, uh, not only is the couple's relationship temporary, but also this temporary game they played together with the opportunity of these few days was very interesting. This, is, this was probably a opportunity for them to share these secrets, these last secrets and move on as individuals. I like this story very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Atish. Um, I really, really like the way you said that you come to the book after 20 years with a new pair of eyes. And that again is something that I will take away because in this reader writer uh, kind of um, relationship, the way you looked at interpreter of melodies before you went to the US and now that you are there and you point that out, you know, uh, as a, a, a seminal point in your relationship with the author and her work, Stella, thank you. Um, Sangeeta, let's hear your view, Sangeeta Kishlu. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, well, um, everybody's covered such a lot, but uh, Chumpa Lahiri's writing is uh, simple and effortless, and yet so poignant. And it, it, ha it has a very quiet, comforting, well, not comforting, quiet, melancholy tone about it. And um, 
she sets and in the first story itself she actually sets the mood for the rest of the the other eight stories and there is a very um obvious connected connecting thread that runs through all these stories and this is largely the uh, fragmenting of relationships and um well the first one it is husband and wife and as indrani said they should have gone to a therapist but if you see the relationships in the other stories they are not the fracturing of relationships of husband and wife necessarily they are a lot of them are fracturing of relationships because of a uh, cultural mismatch for example mrs sen and the boy she was tutoring for example sexy miranda and uh, the indian boy she was dating it was it was obvious that relationship would not last so um you know this breaking of relationship is not necessarily between husband and wife in fact the last story which uh, uh, i forgot the name of the boy who went to attend his marriage in calcutta which i really found a sweet expression and uh, you know and he i think waited for a year or many months for his wife to come and there was such a simple um uh, faithfulness about him the way he waited for his wife and i think that marriage lasted uh, very beautifully you know they they say after 30 years his, his son is also in harvard now so um on second you know when i was contemplating i saw it's not necessarily about marriages breaking up there are also a um, the sort of adjustment also and uh, if you ask me which was my favorite story um i'd say well i have many favorites but i really liked mrs sen simply because of the imagery and the smells and the sounds that jhumpa lahiri creates with her language and uh, as julie mentioned uh, you know the boti the shape of a viking i mean like even here we don't use a boti so she's taken her really middle class home to calcutta and she's sitting on the floor and cutting onions in front of this american boy and then you can literally get the smell of the onions and the coconut oil and uh, you know very evocative in terms of uh, the smells that uh, you know she creates so um, and then of course her visits to the fish market and uh, and the fish monger saying that uh, do you have a cat when she says i want the head separately so i found that quite um, humorous and colorful and again that was a that marriage worked out very well but the relationship between the american boy and her and her efforts at driving the car were for of course um quite sad um sangeeta you're out of time and you've given us a lot of material okay sorry and uh, no worries no worries i particularly liked your bringing to focus and literally lifting up the conversation with jhumpa lahiri as a synesthetic writer she you can almost feel the palpability is there smell audio you know olfactory uh visual everything brings uh the story to the fore for the reader uh, almost saying here's a platter here's what our tradition is here's what our heritage is come taste some that is so on point thank you thank you sangeeta uh, thank you uh, uh sangeeta now um vivek Let's see what Vivek has to offer us today. Okay, can Vivek. you hear me? Yes, Vivek Krishna, please go ahead. Okay, right. Well, a couple of things. One is uh, Nilanjana Sudeshna Jumpa Lahiri. It was a big name uh, to start with when she was born, and she's continued all the all through her life so far. Uh, the tales that make up the book came out in print in various magazines in the years preceding the publication of her collection. and apparently she is mentioned somewhere that her early short stories faced rejection from publishers for years which i find quite amusing in in uh, in retrospect lahiri later wrote when i first started writing i was not conscious that my subject was the indian american experience what drew me to my craft was my desire to force the two worlds i occupied to mingle on the page as i was not brave enough or mature enough to allow in my life itself emerson once wrote that power resides in the moment of transition from a past to a new state and jumpa's use of simple language to convey complex thoughts is the key to her power close attention to each day's details in one's life 
lift the stories to another level. I was left wondering how she moves a seemingly simple <laughs> plot to its climax. <laughs> leaving me to know please, more. Sorry, Vivek, please mute yourself. If you're a member of the audience, it is disturbing for the rest of the people. Please mute yourself. Thank you, Vivek. Right. I was left wondering how she moves a seemingly simple plot to its climax, leading me to want to know more about the character. It is because, of course, that her use of language is anything but simple. And I often return to a thought or a paragraph to savor the flavor of the moment. She doesn't flinch in portraying physical intimacy, but I was left applauding her sensitivity and the pertinence to the context. I waited to get used to her, to her presence at my side, at my table, and in my bed, but a week later, we were still strangers. At night, we kissed, shy at first, but quickly bold and discovered pleasure and solace in each other's arms. Uh, this is the last story in the book. And at the end of the story, remember, Mala says and smiles, amazed as I am, that there was ever a time that we were strangers. It was a lovely thought. Something happened when the house went dark. They were able to talk to each other again. The fourth night, they walked carefully upstairs to bed, feeling together for the final step with their feet before the landing and making love with the desperation that they had forgotten. The bittersweet story fashioned around a stillborn child ends with Shobha had turned the lights off and she came back to the table and sat down. And after a moment, Shukumar joined her and they wept together for the things they now knew. I have to say, like the others, I really felt that it was going somewhere and that they were getting back together again but that was not to be. And having looking back now, I think, well, this probably was the best ending. Jhumpa's stories are rendered more powerful by the sense of cultural transition and loss. They were all like sibling Mr. Kampasi thought as they passed by a row of date trees. Mr. and Mrs. Das behaved like an older brother and sister, not parents. Everything is here, Mrs. Sen says of India, but her story begins with the fact that she herself is no longer is. And we find characters like Mr. and Mrs. Das, who are so distant from their Indian heritage that they need a tour guide. And we find Mrs. Sen, who sits on her floor every day, chopping vegetables in the same way she did in India, with the same boti that she used in India. The two themes which arise most frequently are marriage and the relationship that the Indian characters have with their Indian ancestry. The last story is the only one in which an arranged marriage is mentioned. And it is also the only story that shows us such a happy result in a marriage. The narrator and his wife embrace life in America, but also embrace their Indian heritage more fully than most of the book's other characters, suggesting to us the source of their happiness and success. While the astronauts, heroes forever, spent mere hours on the moon, I have remained in this new world for nearly 30 years, and I know that my achievement is quite ordinary. I am not the only man to seek his fortune far from home, and certainly I am not the first. Still, there are times I am bewildered by each mile I have traveled, each meal I have eaten, each person I have known, each room in which I have slept. As ordinary as it all appears, there are times when it is beyond my imagination. Thank you. Took my breath away and took so many of our breaths away. Such an all-rounded, overwhelming, freewheeling, exhausting, and incisive assessment, Vivek. What I think is quite the takeaway from yours is that you point out that in such simple stories, there is so much heroism. And as you said, you know, a short story, they say, technically should have a twist in the tale. And in a temporary matter, I also felt the first time I read it years ago that, hey, they're going to get, get back together. Yeah, 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 we want that. Doesn't happen. They go their different ways. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the members to finish and then get on to Mickey, uh, Dr. M um, Mickey Bhatia, who's my therapist friend, and see what she has to say. Okay. Um, Parumita, and then Harish, if he wants to say something, and then we move on to our valued guest. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Julie. Di. Thank you, Julie. Di. It's always a pleasure to be in this book discussion. And Julie, Di, you take it forward so well. It's an amazing experience. Um, I'll start with Interpreter of Maladies, where 
like every short story just now you just mentioned every short story has have to has have, you know it has to have a twist so there was the twist what was the malady mr kapasi was an interpreter of maladies of gujaratis in, in in odessa but what was the malady here so when he hears out mrs das so that was a wonderful twist in the story a simple read simple language very easy to understand all the stories again mr peer zada was i really could feel it because my father he used to talk about dhaka he was a very well known professor of calcutta university my grandfather had come from dhaka so to calcutta so you know that was very emotional for me that partition where she talks about partition east bengal and west bengal so that was very emotional and again i come back to the temporary matter where the discussion argument was going on i know many of you will laugh at me but i am an eternal optimist eternal optimist that i am i felt that shobha and shukumar when they started crying after listening to you know those midnight the power cut uh, stories i think there can be a coming back when when you weep out when you weep out your depressions weep out your sadness there can be a closure to their going apart so they can come back there is a chance of them coming back so i felt so so that was my optimist thought dr paramita mukherjee molik is a poet and you can see that the optimism that drives her poetry also drives her analysis i love it Thank you so much for being the eternal optimist in our group. Thank you, Param. Thank you, um, Harish. We have one uh, slot for two minutes for you. Do you want to come in? Is there, is there something you want me to say? Yes, as a historian, how would you see the diasporic writer, for instance? in the current situation of asian lives matter and all the killings of asians do you not think that the fiction should now take a turn for a kind of activism that's what i want you to talk about yes so i think uh, when we talk about the kind of genres uh, I, i think there's a certain dating to jhumpa lehri i think uh, a lot of literary criticism Uh, would be that the whole or the story of the indian immigrant in america or wherever has been told uh, numerous times by numerous authors and that there's very little left there you know the 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 the, the bone the carcass has been picked clean so uh, i think that's the problem and you know because there's nothing really exciting about uh, the whole story because it's being told and retold uh, in different forms now uh, you can have a very uh, humanistic form uh, you can have you know uh, the hum drum activities of a normal you know person living in boston or wherever the jhumpa lahiri's uh, very human approach uh, to settling down you know in a foreign culture uh, and uh, and therefore and therefore cut yourself off cut your narrative off from the real problems that exist in your adopted homeland and these are the problems that you refer to you know the 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 status of inequality of uh, the dominant african american community and how remote and cut off the indian immigrant is from the overall realities and the injustices that are in north america and how easily the indians put themselves into little little silos uh, from where they they you know they're quite happy eating their masala dosas and their dhoklas and and meeting their indian friends and you know there's an occasional white man or white woman who comes in and out of their lives but uh, they the troubling aspects of life in boston you know the 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 uh, assaults on sikhs the the killings of uh, the brown boys in pubs you know all of that 
is, is missing in, in the story. Um, so I think, uh, uh, if I may just take a second more, is that a lot of Indian immigrants have taken uh, because they're so busy with their lives and, you know, the business of uh, paying their mortgages, you know, because not everybody goes with money. So the life itself is a big struggle and, you know, you have a job and, you know, you're always conscious that any moment the layoff can come. Uh, so, uh, and it's very normal in North America uh, for a person to be, to have changed 12 jobs in a career. Uh, so given all these constraints and you know you understand where uh, the, the the narrative of the immigrant comes from because uh, it, it's really a concern it's, it's a concerning issue thank you, uh, thank, you. thank you harish um really those are the points i want to raise because we see none of this in um jumba lahiri's work it's a different kind of work but i needed us to uh, unpack it the uh, politics of it. All right, so we are done with our club members. Now for our esteemed guests, I want to start with um, Ritu Gulati, who's um, a museologist based out of London, avid, voracious reader. She was the one who introduced me to Elif Shafak, which we all enjoyed in this book club a couple of uh, months ago. So without further ado, Ritu, three minutes is all you've got, baby. Go with it and tell us what you thought. All right, I'm going to speed through this. Um, so uh, firstly, I, I, I'm going to start by one second. I loved how Harish uh, analyzed the whole thing, but that's another, another topic. So coming back to me, so my response here will be very controversial for two reasons. One, that I'm talking about a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist. And secondly, because she's a Bengali and I risk offending all the Bengalis on this group. As I read the collection of nine stories, I felt like I was reading, I'm sorry to say a middle school course book. Uh, it was without any intellectuality and I would like to call it unexceptional. I went about searching for reviews and could only find complimentary reviews extolling her writing as I quote, Lyrie's rise is part of a change of guard in American fiction. Uh, Times and the New York Times both wrote, Lyrie's new book uh, um, represents a fundamental shift in direction of the American novel. No longer can, can be considered under the direction of white American born men, but is now informed by the experience of the immigrant or another review called her the chronicler of the immigrant experience. So the question here is, why did she win the prize? As, as I think Vivek said, uh, or somebody said, you know, she wrote the stories and they were, um, they were rejected. Um, is that the Pulitzer Prize Committee wanted to prove their inclusivity and diversity because of the, as Julie mentioned, you know, the time of Obama um, becoming president, I don't know. But um, in searching for uh, a, a critical quote, I found this one. The stylistic simplicity is bordering on dullness. And honestly, I did feel that. Anyway, so on a different note, if I was to summarize the book, there are three themes that re resonate through the nine stories. One being social and emotional maladjustment. Two being the confused hybrid identity of the immigrant three being the unhappy bored marriage. Uh, while I did, uh, I have encountered Mr. Pirzada in my life or maybe a Burima uh, and perhaps even a Mr. Kapasi, but I didn't quite understand. Uh, but I think over the reviews, I, I, I have now come to understand uh, Mrs. Das's um, uh, uh, personality. So for me, the story that was complete, I, I'll, I'll eliminate that. So to summarize, uh, I finished the novel questioning my own intellectual inability to understand and to find the exceptional. Uh, and to, and I was curious about the validity of the Pulitzer Prize Committee and their choices. 
Um, after, especially after Julie said, you know, we've read Alicia Fark and um, and her ten minutes and thirty eight seconds, and we had such a wonderful um, book club meeting on that. And then Kazuo Ishiguro, who deserved deserves the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, uh, sorry, Nobel Prize of Literature. So I leave you at that thought. Uh, and like I said, uh, apologies for for my review. Ritu, there is no need to apologize. This is why this book club is, you know, the kind of vivacious place we all come and, uh, you know, exchange views on. Thank you for that. Thank you for the courage and the bravery and your insight, which is what we admire. All right. I think a good person to come in here at this moment and uh, give us the therapeutic take on uh, the short stories we are discussing today is Mickey Bhatia. Mickey, I hope you're here. Yeah, I am, Julie. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> Three minutes. Before. Okay. So, uh, firstly, Julie, thank you for having me here. I mean, I've heard so many comments from all of you. I agree with most of them. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to jump right into it by saying that it's my loss that I got to hear from Julie about this book club and she wanted me to comment on the psychological aspect of it and the diasporic aspect of it. And I got to hear this just about a couple of days ago and I haven't been able to read all the stories. The only one I have read is The Temporary Matter and I've read her book, like somebody said, 20 years ago. So I'm gonna just draw on some knowledge of mine. Now taking into consideration one of the questions that was raised that why didn't they see a therapist? from a diasporic point of view and from a personal point of view, somebody who emigrated to Canada more than 25 years ago, yeah. had my own set of experiences there, came back. I just like to share that whether you're in India or whether you're out of India, somewhere this whole stigma about seeing a therapist must have been somewhere there. And perhaps it was not so easy. But when somebody mentioned about the fact that maybe something in the marriage was already going sour. I was struck by a couple of things in the text. And one of them was that actually she had a, so it made me think that they actually adjusted quite well to living in Boston because they seemed to have a good life. And she had become someone at 33 years, which she didn't want to become, whatever that meant. But she also had a party on her birthday or something. And there were 150 people. So one kind of wondered, where did all this go? Uh, especially after she lost that baby. And I'm just wondering how much of that has to do with loss and the inability to deal with that loss. And as Atish said, I'm sure other things that also drive people apart in a relationship. So I just want to bring in the psychoanalytic aspect a little bit over here. And I just want to say this, to you that the word vulnerable means wound. The term involves an opening or exposure and the susceptibility to pain. In a psychoanalytic context, we think of vulnerability in terms of the undoing of ego defenses, a collapsing of those barriers that protect us from emotional pain. Most often that pain involves our dependency on others, a dependency that exposes us to rejection, loss and shame. Without vulnerability to the pain of dependency, however, the experience of genuine intimacy or love is not possible. Now, I think Jhumpa Lahiri is trying to play with this emotional vulnerability. Her work reveals a contradictory dynamic at play. On the one hand, the wish to open ourselves fully, to be exposed and vulnerable, and therefore loved, and on the other, an equally compelling need to meet, to remain private and protected. The dynamics of vulnerability that distinguish Lahiri's work can, can be illuminated by Donald Winnicott's idea, and Donald Winnicott was a psychoanalyst, and the name of the paper is Communicating and Not Communicating, leading to a study of certain opposites. In it, he writes of discovering in himself a need to assert the right not to communicate. 
a protest from the core of me to the frightening fantasy of being infinitely exploited. This, I want to say, is the core of therapy and the reason why probably lots of, reason, lots of reasons why people don't come for therapy. He also refers to this fantasy as the fantasy of being found. He goes on to explain, although healthy persons communicate and enjoy communicating, the other fact is equally true that each individual is an isolate, permanently non-communicating, permanently unknown, in fact, unfound. Nikki, can we hold it there? Because you have given us such a wonderful focus as well as an unveiling of the issue of the stigma attached to couples who need therapy so desperately, but because of the stigma attached to it, they don't go and get it. And that's why uh, this particular couple in Shubindu and Shoba, their relationship disintegrated. You brought out a wonderful theorist uh, right now and the idea of vulnerability equated with a wound. So you're thinking of a gaping hole. Absolutely. And how do you mend it? Or is it even possible to mend it if you don't go and get, it's like learning the violin, learning to drive a car. You need an expert to show you the way. And, I think, and if I may respond, I think that expert, if you manage to find yourself in good hands, is the interpreter of maladies, which can be a psychoanalyst. In a way, it's this really vulnerable, vulnerable path that people bring to analysis. Now, not everybody can come for analysis, Julie, and all you people. But the fact of the matter is, Julie, that there are lots of other kinds of therapies also available. There is counseling, there is cognitive behavior therapy, there are different kinds of therapies. But that will address something from the behavior point of view. I really don't know how much that goes deep inside. Yeah. And I think if not too much is wrong, cognitive behavior therapy can help. I'm not belittling it at all. But I think to really understand it from the core, I think one really needs to get to the vulnerability. So you need two very strong people. You need an analyst who's very strong and you need a patient or, or a person who has a very strong ego to be able, or a very healthy ego, to be able to handle that breaking down. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're actually breaking down people's defenses and yeah. then building them back together. Correct. Thank you so much, Mickey. That was priceless. That was priceless for all of us. Thanks so much. Sana, all the way from Toronto. <coughs> Are you there? Sana Hashmi, are you there? Okay, we will come hi, back. Hi, Julie. Oh, great. Hi, <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> go ahead. Go Sorry, ahead. It, took, it took a little while to get my mic on for some reason. Go ahead. Okay, so I just want to say that um, I really enjoyed these short stories. Yeah. Um, I think this was the favorite thing that I've read in this book club so far. Um, I think yeah. I liked it even better than Alif Shafak's uh, novel that we read. So just want to put that out there. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much is because I am a diasporic person and I really felt that Jhumpa Lahiri um, I think she really talked about uh, the story of diaspora in a way that I could relate to. And um, it was it was just it was a really great read. And even though it was written in 1999, I felt that it was still very salient. Mm -hmm. And to speak to your comment about your question about um, why in the first story they didn't get um, couples therapy, I think it's just because in North America, couples therapy has just sort of become even more popular in the last 22 years. So I can only imagine that in 1999, it was probably not as popular. And, and, um, and so I think just remembering that it's written in 1999, there are some things that are a little bit dated, but at the same time, I still felt that there were so many things that I still connected to, which I think is a testament to the power of really great literature. 
So just to read a couple of the notes that I prepared. Um, so I think uh, the interpreter of maladies illustrates the complex story of diaspora displacement and belonging. And I think it's done very well because it's done through the eyes of children, for example. It's done through the motifs and themes of marriages, separations, infidelity, and intergenerational experiences of immigration. And I think these are all really great ways to explore this very complicated topic of diaspora. And I think Jumbo Lahiri did a really great job at that. So just to speak to some of these themes very briefly. So the theme of marriage, union, separation, infidelity helps illustrate the issue of belonging and separation. Not only does it do this, it is through these literary devices that we are able to interpret the tensions between tradition, modernity, and change as you mentioned earlier, Julie. So it's not just the familial relations that are being explained here. I think that it, it's, it's a great way to explain these very deep themes. Uh, for example, in the blessed house, we're shown Twinkle's husband's perplexity towards his westernized wife. So I think that's more than just showing um, a relationship between two people. It's also showing a larger theme of um, tradition and modernity. Another motif that I found very interesting was the intergenerational experiences of immigration. So for example, throughout the narrative, um, Lahiri sort of stops the narrative to comment on the age of her characters. So whether this is a 30 year old or a child, this motif is especially successful in illustrating the intergenerational experience of diaspora. And this is perhaps why it is still so relevant today as I mentioned earlier. So um, an example of this is with Mr. and Mrs. Sen and the grad students in a temporary matter. And finally, um, the last motif I wanna speak to is the uh, motif of location and dislocation. So out of the nine stories, seven of these speak to the experience of immigration in North America. However, two of these stories focus on India exclusively. So for example, a real Darwan and the treatment of Bibi Hildi. I think these are two very interesting stories because they show how the experience of being a social outcast like B.B. Hildy, for example, can mirror those experiences of people in the diaspora in North America. And I think a real Derwan shows how being ejected forcibly from one's home is possibly something many refugees in the diaspora can also relate to. And it's also interesting, it's not just the, her physical eviction from her home, but it's also um, I think they mentioned partition in that story. She mentions partition in that story as well. And in conclusion, I think um, the interpreter of maladies, the, the main story here, perfectly blends together all the themes I have mentioned above. I don't think it's a coincidence that the story is told through the perspective of a tour guide and an interpreter. We have tourists from New Jersey visiting India. We see in this stor story, also the themes of marriage, infidelity, intergenerational experiences of displacement. For example, the tour guide becomes very self-conscious about his age towards the end of the story when the woman speaks to him. And when the phone number flies out of her purse at the end of the story, we are once again reminded of the complexity of the, of the issues sound, um, surrounding diaspora. So in The Interpreter of Maladies by Jhumpa Lahiri, I think she does an excellent job overall of describing these intergenerational, international longings and belongings. And for this reason, I can see why it is the title of the collection of short stories, which I think are very excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Love the way you um, signposted and actually- uh, please, mute, mute, please mute yourself if you're the audience. Mrs. Archana Khaitan would be very grateful if you would mute yourself, please. So, um, Sana, to be, uh, you know, uh, to be on point on what you said, um, I'd like to say that the way you, you, in your mind as a reader, you put forth the fact that she's still relevant, yeah. which is a point of contention in today's uh, debate about her, as you could see with Ritu Gulati and Harish Mehta's uh, points. So I think you've sort of um, corralled all the issues that make her a favorite uh, 
writer amongst a lot of young diasporic people, not just necessarily South Asians, but Southeast Asians and, and the generation of uh, hyphenated Canadians and Americans. Thank you very much, Sana. That was extremely uh, helpful. Thank you. So, um, Mohini, Mohini Pradhan, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mohini, would love to hear your views. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, absolutely. A little louder wouldn't hurt, Mohini. Sure, ma'am. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to begin with uh, thanking Dr. Julie Mehta for giving me the opportunity to speak on this text. It was a great experience in exploring the complexities that are present in them. So one of the best things that I like about literature is the flexibility and the evolution of interpretations. And such is the case with interpreter maladies. So, and my first introduction to Jhumpa Lairi was with the story, uh, A Real Darwan, which was a part of my prescribed text in school. So at that time, my interpretation was rather simplistic as I was only sympathetic towards Burima and the treatment that was meted out to her. However, on reading the stories together, my uh, interpretation involved, and it is, I noticed that it is a great example of diasporic literature with characters like Mrs. Shobha and, sorry, Shobha and Mrs. Sen trying to recreate the feel of the native land in their new homes on a different continent. As uh, Sana, as also, Ms. Sana has also mentioned, that it's uh, quite difficult to assimilate yourself to the culture and um, be a part of it. And there are different challenges that accompany it. So, um, this apparently is done through their food, which is one of the most fascinating aspects that I have found uh, in the short stories collection, along with the idea of the psychological inquiry into the characters' minds. So I would like to begin with the food idea. So it is a recurring motive in the stories, as we see it in various forms, happening, uh, being a part of the lives of most of the characters, whether it be Shobha's very meticulous way of uh, arranging her kitchen, which I found very fascinating, and Mrs. Sen's uh, uh, quest for authenticity in her food, which is being so far away from her homeland. Uh, or even it may be the the, the, the Das family having those um, the, the, the roasted snacks that they were having uh, during the vacation. So in each of the stories, you see uh, some idea of food incorporated with it. And that's quite fascinating considering Jhumpa Lahiri also has mentioned that food was an important part of her life as it was her mother's jurisdiction and her secret. So therefore, food becomes an element of forming one's cultural identity in a foreign land. And it has also been brought up in her novel namesake, as Ma'am has already mentioned. And I found a quote in an article about namesake where a lady named Maria Del Diaz writes that throughout food, sorry, throughout the novel, food plays an important role as a link between the characters and their Bengali roots. The characters, especially Ashima, tend to adapt to American products to their own tradition. So here we also see food acting as a bridge, which uh, happens in the namesake, as well as in the story, Mr. Prasada comes to dine, where even though there was a political partition happening, it had brought two families together, the family of Lilia and uh, Mr. Prasada. Which, and it's, it's quite a beautiful bond, the way they sit down and uh, Lilia talks about the way they eat and how they are similar. And even though her father says that he, they're not similar, he's not similar to them, she does, she, as a child, she can see that there are different, the way they do the same things as humans. So that brings me to the point of uh, the psychological complexity in the novel, because uh, as is the tradition of the short story genre, that there's a lot to decipher from the limited words available in the stories. So here we see a representation of psychological states and maladies, and that's giving the meaning to the title of the collection. And I feel that uh, Mr. Kapasi's job as an interpreter of medical maladies can be seen of, uh, as an extension of Jhumpa Lahiri herself, as she presents the emotional complexities of her characters. I do not claim to have an informed opinion about uh, psychology, but uh, all her characters exhibit a certain level of suffering, which were presented as shades of human life as well either the loss or separation of a home or a loved one in the case of Mrs. Sen and Shobha and Mr. Prasada, the anxiety and curiosity in Lilia, the resentment in the case of Mrs. Kapasi, the guilt from Shukumar, Miranda, 
and Mr. Kapasi or the rejection faced by Bibi Haldar from her own family members, to name a few. Therefore, she presents a rather wide scope within the structure of nine short stories, which I think is quite uh, amazing. And um, she gives the readers the flexibility to interpret the stories in their own way. And not only for interpretation, she also makes them look, have an insight into their own lives and their own interactions with other people. And uh, it's basically food for thought and due to the open-ended uh, open structure of the stories. So those were my observations on the text. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Mohini, um, I'm glad that you dealt with food waste and food culture, which is uh, very neglected when we talk about Shumpa Lahiri's works. And uh, you brought theory to praxis by uh, talking about acculturation and, uh, you know, each of her stories being signposted with some element of her own tradition, which she comes to through her parents, as you say, her mother had the full jurisdiction about food. Thank you for that, Mohini. Okay, looking greatly forward also to Raka Mukherjee. Now, Mohini, incidentally, is um, the final IMA student, as is Raka at Loreto College, and Harsh Kumar Singh doing a joint presentation. Go right ahead. Looking greatly forward, Raka. And you have six minutes, three plus three between two of you. Please stick to the time. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, today. And Harsh, take it away. Harsh, you're on mute. Harsh, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so it's the paper is on uh, negotiating the idea of home in Jhumpa Lahiri's Interpreter of Maladies. So Nilanjana Sudeshna Lahiri's Interpreter of Maladies seems to be a culmination of the constant tug of war in her mind to not only find her own identity in a changing world, but having to find a place in two worlds. As she had once written in Newsweek in 2006, where she expressed her inner turmoil, saying, when I was growing up in Rhode Island in the 1970s, I felt neither Indian nor American. Like many immigrant offspring, I felt intense pressure to be two things, loyal to the old world and fluent in the new. My perception as a young girl was that I feel and I felt shot at both ends, shuttling between two dimensions that had nothing to do with one another. Lahiri explores through her work, the immigrant experience, the dynamics of what comprises a home. The construction and destruction of homes transcending physical space manifest into Foucauldian heterotopias through time and people. Homi Bhabha, in his essay, The World and the Home, talks about the unhomely. He explains, to be unhomed is not to be homeless, nor can the unhomely be easily accommodated in the familiar division of social life into private and public spheres. In a feverish stillness, the intimate recesses of the domestic sphere become sites for history's most intricate invasions. In the displacement, the border between home and world becomes confused and uncannily, the private and the public become part of each other forcing upon us a vision that is divided and disoriented. The first story, A Temporary Matter, focuses on a home that once was, but no longer is, due to a tragedy that the protagonists face in the loss of their child. How he and Shoba had become experts and avoiding each other in the three-bedroom house, spending as much time on separate floors as possible. The darkness allowed them to masquerade their faces creating a heterotopia of crisis where the intimacy was ritualistic, but restricted to the slice of time when the power went off. The silences in light and the anecdotes in the shadow created a chiaroscuro painting of emotions that eventually culminated in the confession of separation. Shobha switching on the light and wanting Shukumar to look at her face when she informs him about finding a new apartment and Shukumar retaliating by revealing the gender of their dead baby ultimately breaks the home that they lived in and they found in each other. And in this way, they were unhomed while together. The second story, when Mr. Pizada came to dinner, we 
come across a homesick Indian family living in Boston. The desperation to invite someone from their homeland to their home is drawn from their feeling of missing their home. The initial encounter with the eponymous Mr. Pirzada presents us with the picture of how similar their habits were, how the family thought of him as one of their own, creating a home away from home. While he was in constant anxiety for his family, Lilia remembers, and I quote, the three of them operating during that time as if they were a single person, sharing a single meal, a single body, a single silence, and a single fear. Watching the news together in the American TV, the idea of home is no longer determined by the idea of geography, but a sense of belonging and emotional support. In the diasporic life, food too played an important role to bring the two homes, one in the Orient and one in the Occident together. In the third and the titular story, Interpreter of Maladies, the idea of dysfunctional marriages collects into the characters of Mrs. Das and Mr. Kapasi. The former, an NRI tourist trapped in an untruthful and unhappy marriage, confides her secret to the latter, an Indian tour guide, and also an interpreter of the maladies of various patients to a doctor. Despite the distinctive dissimilarities between their family background and lifestyle, both of them inhabited a home that they wanted to escape. As Mr. Kapasi receives a compliment about his thankless job to be romantic, he notices the physical features of Mrs. Das and his desire for her acceptance and elopement with him forges the idea of a camaraderie in the home of his sight. This reminds us of the friendship shared between Adila and Dr. Aziz in E.M. Foster's A Passage to India. The erotic images of the Naga Michuna carved into the Konak temple mirror the quest at the Marabar caves in Foster's novel. However, the exchange of confessions and wishful thinking comes to a pathetic halt when while the family returns from the trip and a quote, the slip of paper with Mr. Kapasi's address and it fluttered away in the wind, thus severing any possible future ties between the Das family and Mr. Kapasi, demolishing the home of his imagination into rubble of a reality check. The characters of Murima in a real Darwan and Mrs. Sen are two nameless uprooted individuals who are trapped in the physical and psychological space between the Freudian Heimlich, the known, and the unheimlich, the unknown. While Burima lost her home as a partition refugee and was deported to Calcutta, Mrs. Sen was forced to move abroad with her arranged marriage. Lahiri's refusal to name these characters and defining them with regard to being a darwan and a wife reinforced their loss of identity in a new space and their yearning to return to their golden past. Burima's uttering such comforts you can't even dream of, and Mrs. Sen saying, at home, you know, we have a driver, both project their longing for the heterotopia of time that they had once lived, refusing to call their present space their home. The concluding story, the third and final continent, is a multicultural shift of three geographic spaces, but in each shift, there is a positive construction of home and relationships. The Bengali MIT engineer who migrated to America first finds a home as a tenant to a 103-year-old Mrs. Croft. Their ceremonious exchanges on the bench about her stating, there is an American flag on the moon, and him replying splendid, had knit together a bond where he perhaps found reflection of his late mother who passed away in his Calcutta home. When his wife Mala arrived in America and it was time to move out from Mrs. Cross, the sense of betrayal at not getting an emotional goodbye stuck with him. This mirrors both Lilia and Elliot and reminds us of the concluding lines of Tagore's The Postmaster. We cling with both arms to false hope, refusing to believe in the weightiest proofs against it, embracing it with all our strength. In the end, it escapes, dripping our veins and draining our heart's blood until regaining consciousness, we rush to fall into snares of delusion all over again. However, unlike the relationship of Shobha and Shukumar in the first story, the narrator's relationship with his wife in the third and final continent develops into love after Mrs. Croft approves of Mala saying she is a perfect lady. The shifts happen seamlessly. When Mrs. Croft passes away, Mala stands beside him to mourn together the loss of a home in a person and in a way becomes his home. This story ends with the protagonist looking back at the spaces he inhabited and how their son had now shifted to find his destiny. The idea of relocation here 
resonates Gaston Bachelard's comment in Poetics of Space. The space we love is unwilling to remain permanently enclosed. It deploys and appears to move elsewhere without difficulty into other times and on other different planes of dream and memory. It is perhaps befitting to conclude that Chumpa Ahiru's assortment of anecdotes presents us with the idea that home, which is mostly defined in a dictionary as a place of domicile or a social unit of a family living together, is not simply a static concept defined in words, for its dynamics are much more inert and dependent on the attachment of people to one another, and only when the powerful emotions of love, hope, and peaceful coexistence can be established with someone can we say that we are truly home? Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely overwhelming. Wonderful. What a lovely partnership between Harsh and you, Raka. And the points you've brought up, the intertextuality from Eliot to Gaston Bachelard, my favorite theorist. And I love that idea of between the private and the public sphere, between home and the world, you bring the binaries in a non-static way, both of you. And the evolution of that space that Bachelard Scott speaks about, so well explicated by you both. And Harsh, who talks about how that space itself evolves and the effect and the affect on the human being in that space. Already the diaspora is such a difficult, challenging, uh, evolving space. And you bring that out really well. Love that line, site for histories. You know, that idea of the location of culture and the location of history, again, goes back to Homi Baba. Brilliant. Thank you so much, both of you. OK, we have um, a you. young, thank you. We have a young. Um, you know, uh, forward looking, very creative, um, film studies scholar, um, Dev Shurju Dhar. Are you here, Dev Shurju? Yes, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're from Jalapur University and you're a, a master's in um, film study. You're doing your master's in film studies. And I believe you have a connection uh, with Chumpalahiri on a personal level because you wanted. Oh, did you do a script? Did you write a script? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. On, inter I did. on, on interpreter yeah. of melodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please tell us. Tell us about it. Uh, okay. Uh, they've showed okay. you three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, Jhumpa Lahiri's Interpreter of Melodies, which is the third story in the anthology. Now, what makes this story so incredibly cinematic, in my opinion, is its attention to the intricate details, details that are often visual and auditory in nature. Now, the fact that she uses details doesn't really bug me much because uh, like considering the kind of cinematic vocabulary that Lahiri inherited from her mother. Here, I cannot resist the temptation to mention the fact that her grandfather was a colleague of Hotojit Rai at, the, at, at uh, DJ Kema. And at one point of time, he even considered her mother for the role of Durga in his magnum opus, Pothe Pachali. Um, but in today's discussion, I would like to elaborate on a completely different aspect of the story altogether. I would be looking at how she uses the car, in this case, the white ambassador, as a vehicle to not only carry forward the narrative, but to also use it as a prop to explore the inner psyches of the characters based on the way they react to it and the people whom they share that space with. So uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, Vehicles like cars, trucks, and buses started playing a ubiquitous role in both cinema and literature, as did the railway at the verge of the 19th century. Alan Trachtenberg writes in his foreword to uh, Wolfgang Schivenbusch's book, The Railway Journey, how the 19th century novels started to treat the railway journey as a mode of social interaction filled with various possibilities rather than an event of spatial relocation. In a similar way, Thomas Flight, uh, in one of his video essays, says that the car is never a mode of transportation, but an extension of the character that drives it. He goes on to say that the car is a location and its interior a dramatic stage. 
it is how the people trapped in these particular speeding spaces react to it that we get to know who they are like for instance the way mr kapasi uses the rear view mirror which is an extension of his white ambassador uh, reveals a certain aspect of his character at the very beginning of the story let's see how lahiri puts this into words so i'm quoting her from the story um, in the rear view mirror mr kapasi watched as mrs das emerged slowly from his bulky white ambassador dragging her shaved largely bare legs across the back seat we can see a clear emphasis on what mr kapasi sees in the mirror and the series of thoughts that the sight instigates in his mind it is as if mr kapasi's repressed desires are subjected to the mirror this can be linked to the freudian idea of scopophilia which uh, in general terms is associated with the kind of sexual pleasure one derives from simply looking at an object of their sexual desire a question of the male gaze automatically comes into play and can be explained using laura mulvey's phenomenal work on the subject now it is interesting to look at how mrs das's perception of this space inside the car changes over time the same car which was the topic of a small cross talk between her and mr and mr das at the beginning became a space comfortable enough to be compared to a therapist's couch by the end of the story this reminded me of rise nayok where orindam the hero makes an attempt like mrs das to spill out his years long repressed secrets about himself to aditi in a semi climactic sequence the train which he preconceived to be a not so safe place for a mere conversation turned out to be quite therapeutic at the end i would like to end my talk by mentioning a possible coincidence in the story the sun temple where the family is headed isn't an ordinary location it is actually in lahiri's words a massive pyramid like structure in the shape of a chariot a chariot which is an ancient predecessor of a modern day speeding vehicle no wonder it is mr kapasi's favorite place the topless women engraved on the structure which reminds him that he has never seen his own wife completely naked plays a similar role in titillating his repressed desires as did the rear view window uh, window uh, of his own car thank you deep shujo we are going to see much more of you we are not letting you go okay <laughs> because uh, you know what you bring to the table is so rich it's different and it actually teaches uh us in the realm of literature or history a totally you know a, a disparate and a very uh, enhancing aspect for instance your assertion about trains not just being trains uh, a car being more than just a mode of transport uh in the realm of cinema and the theory that you bring uh upon them mm. is is truly remarkable uh you know uh, thank you so much absolutely and the chariot with uh the ambassador you know juxtaposition of those two images uh is is a juxtaposition of time past time present is a juxtaposition of space yeah. uh, and it's also a juxtaposition of desire which is fulfilled and unfulfilled yeah so thank you very much and thank you will you be best. hearing from us you will be invited <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Thank you, thank you. So Shibonti, Shibonti, you have the last word before we wrap up. Hello. Hi, Shibonti. Yes, Shibonti is a Shibonti is a very valued librarian at the Bengal Club. She's been with us for nearly twenty years, and about the same time as uh, Jumpa Lahiri published her book. So go right ahead. a uh, good evening everyone the stories of jumpla hiri highlight uh, the feelings that a migrant from the third world experiences in the west the ca her characters are so real th that the, the author provides an opportunity to her readers to identify themselves with her characters although lahiri does not reside in india but her uh, a major part of her work takes up india as the background as a landscape a fictional landscape uh, so we may say that although lahiri can be taken out of india 
but not India out of her. As we do tell about James Joyce, that Joyce can be taken out of Dublin, but not Dublin out of Joyce. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Excellent. Uh, in keeping with Gaston Bachelard, in keeping with uh, Harsh and uh, Raka's presentation, as well as Dev Shujo's ideas about space and time. Thank you, Shibunti. Um, we've come to the end of our uh, lovely event. Uh, can't thank you all enough. I think uh, you would agree, for those of us who've been around, who've stuck around, uh, Shibunti, is this our eighth, uh, eighth book club meeting? Yes, yes, ma'am. Right. So uh, every time that we meet, it gets better. Thank you so much for all your participation, for making the time and for being here. Truly appreciate it. And we'll meet you again next month. I'll let you know what the book is. Thanks again, everybody. And a very good night. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank you, Julie. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Take care, all. Take care.